I uh, made this talk for the Meetup Sense Makers about um, CRISPR and art and CRISPR. Um, do all of you know what CRISPR is? Well, I'll, I'll explain it later, but CRISPR is like um, a method used in synthetic biology to cut DNA in a very specific uh, location. So you can kind of cut and paste DNA like you would with a word processor. And um, I'll talk a bit about it later and how I use it in art projects at Waagtu and also in a documentary that you can watch later. Um, uh, if you have questions during the talk, um, just go for it or something's unclear. Um, we can make it a bit interactive. I have much too much material uh, to share with you in like the 25 minutes that I have. So uh, I'm going through it a bit and I hack together like uh, a presentation in four parts. But I want to start talking about what I do now because now I'm, I live in Amsterdam. Uh, I've, I've lived in Norway for two years, but I'm very happy to be back in Amsterdam. And I do a remote PhD at the Sheffield Hallam University where I'm practice based. So it means like my bio art, which is art using biology is part of my research. And uh, my PhD is called Sensing Microbes. I'm very happy to be at the Sense Makers uh, because uh, my whole uh, topic at the moment is sensing microbes through movement and also through um, translating the gut microbiome into haptics. I don't know if you ever work with haptics with Sense Makers, but like feeling vibrational stuff on the body. Um, and I'm interested in kind of developing sensors and outputs in the next years. I'll show you a bit uh, about that before I start with my real talk. Um, oh no. First, I'm going to start with the introduction and I'm going to talk a bit about what is CRISPR. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the documentary with, with Tegelik when I was working at Waag, also about CRISPR, and then uh, about the project Return to Dilmun, uh, where we used in vitro CRISPR in the lab, and I'll explain to you what it is. And this is kind of an in-depth example of a project using uh, synthetic biology in the in a do-it-yourself bio lab. So this was in Amsterdam uh, at the Waag. And I want to talk a bit too about what is possible and what is not possible to do do-it-yourself because we were quite limited by like genetic regulations and the law and also just the possibilities of like time and energy and money. Uh, but uh, with this project, we found a way to do it, um, to kind of cut and paste DNA without actually introducing it to cells. So you don't actually create like a synthetic uh, manipulated or genetically mod manipulated organism, but you can actually um, uh, manipulate DNA without um, crossing the boundary of the laws. It's hard for me to see the chat, by the way. So if somebody has a question, just kind of unmute and go for it. Um, yeah, I'll keep an eye on the chat, but if you permit people to just go for it, maybe that's even nicer. Yeah, that's nicer. I mean, it's hard because I only have one screen at the moment. Ah, oh, yeah. So what I do now, you can see on my website, so I have a project with microscopy, which I don't talk about now. And I just come back from Buffalo, US. I'm still in a bit of a jet lag, uh, where I did a project called Feel Your Fermented Biome. And this is with Haptic. So what we did is uh, me and my collaborator, Julian Staden, ate uh, fermented foods for four weeks. So every week, a different fermented food uh, with different bacteria in it, such, such as kimchi and kombucha and natto, which all have different bacteria. And then uh, we wanted to see if, the, if these bacteria ended up in our own gut microbiome. Basically, we sampled our poop every week. We swapped our shit in the toilet. And uh, we sent that for sequencing. So we're getting the DNA sequences back. And then we're going to translate this into kind of some kind of experience. So we prototyped already this kind of haptic interface where we, where I felt like the vibrations of Julian microbiome and also some artistic visual interpretations. So this is what I'm working on right now. And I just want to just, um, say it because in the future, I hope to work with people who know more about haptics. Uh, and this is like my start uh, in this endeavor. So now about CRISPR. Um, I, I, I decided to narrow it down because the field of synthetic biology and do-it-yourself bio is so big. So I just focus on this technology, which is relatively new. I mean, it won the Nobel Prize in, ah, oh shit, does somebody know when it won the Nobel Prize? In 2019, I think. Um, it was a big debate as well, who should get the Nobel Prize for it? Um, but basically it is this kind of biotechnology which allows us to cut uh, DNA. I will give a short introduction. So um, in cells such as eukaryotic cells, which it's like mammals and, and humans, which have like a nucleus with a cell wall. Uh, you see that the DNA is in the center of the cell, but then prokaryotic cells, which are like bacteria, you see this red DNA, which is kind of floating in the cell. Um, and the DNA basically has the, 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 
the basic information for the building blocks of life. So this is like the code of life, uh, which is wrapped around these proteins are kind of in a very short, uh, in a very small space. There's a lot of stored information. And uh, within the end, if you read it out, you see here in the end, it's four base pairs, so it's A, G's, C's, and T's. And this means you can read DNA, but you can also write DNA nowadays. Um, and um, uh, CRISPR is then also called uh, kind of a biological version of the search and replace function. If you were to kind of, kind of could, can do like control F or Apple F, whether you're a Mac on a, uh, Windows and kind of search for your word and then replace it, right? And um, with CRISPR, you can do a bit the same. So you have like this big genetic code of whatever the organism is you want to manip manipulate. And you can, using this CRISPR uh, tool, you can easily find the place where you want to cut and then introduce a new gene there or a new part of DNA or, or delete a certain part of DNA. And uh, this um, biotechnology made it much easier to um, manipulate DNA compared to before because the previous techniques were kind of more elaborate or had a higher chance of failing. And this also means it's easier to do it in kind of a do-it-yourself bio context. Uh, because Monique just shared that it was in 2020 that two ladies won uh, the Nobel Prize for it. <laughs> Thanks, 2020, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Jennifer Doudna and uh, uh, Chapanche, the French lady, mm -hmm. who are also in the documentary I'll share later. Yeah, it was a, it's a big debate because Harvard scientists also said they were the first to invent it. And I guess it's with any new technology, uh, like I guess with personal computers too, there's this whole debate about who, who invented it. Um, so CRISPR stands for clustered regularly in the space, short palindromic repeats which is a whole mouthful. This is why they abbreviated as cross, uh, CRISPR. And it comes from uh, bacteria who are uh, attacked by viruses, like, like we were the past uh, two and a half years. And then uh, these bacteria have developed a kind of immune response to that where they kind of save. Um, so this virus, which is here in the top, um, uh, introduces a bit of it, its DNA into this bacteria. But then um, the bacteria saves kind of a small piece of this viral DNA in its own genome. And uh, it does that, so it kind of uses this kind of small piece later uh, to be able to cut the, the, the virus DNA whenever it introduces itself again in the, in, the, in the bacteria. So it can kind of have a kind of immune response to being attacked by viruses. You don't really have to understand this all, but it's kind of similar to kind of how our body generates antibodies when uh, it gets like CRISPR antigens, right? So there's kind of this memory function and it uses this kind of CRISPR system for this. But then scientists saw this kind of immune response or whatever you can call it in bacteria and thought this is cool, this can be hacked and used for our own purposes. So they made it into a technology and basically uh, what you need is this Cas9 protein, which is the blue blob here. And then um, a guide RNA, which is the purple um, uh, loop, which goes in the blue blob. And then this guide RNA has like 20 base pairs or 20 letters uh, where it matches uh, the genome, genomic DNA or the, the part of DNA which you want to cut. And um, if there's this match of like 20 nucleotides, it will cut exactly after that match. So basically this is the part where you can replace this uh, guide RNA with whatever you want the code to be. Uh, so you can, um, uh, you, so you're able to, to very precisely know where you cut your DNA. Um, do you get this part? This is kind of the core of CRISPR. So anyway, you can kind of program this. Any program. questions? Because I think it's going fast. Yeah, I know. Uh, but you're going to add some examples. Well, I'm going to add, like, yeah. But but this is like this is like the core. The so in the, in the lab, so the can... two strings are separated <laughs> by yeah. the guide DNA, and then um, part of that is cut. <laughs> And yeah, so there's this cos9 protein. strengths are replaced. Yeah, there's this cos9 protein which cuts, but then this guide RNA kind of falls into it. So it's kind of this complex of this, of this protein, which is the scissor, and this guide RNA, which is like the pathfinder in a way. Mm -hmm. um, but the cool thing is that this guide RNA has this matching sequence with the DNA. So you can order your own guide RNA. This is what we did in our project too. We kind of sent the code to a company and it got back, and then we had our own... Um, guide RNA template so we could create our own kind of search and replace tool for the So DNA. that means that beforehand you have thought about what you wanted to make yeah. or what yeah. you wanted to change. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, and in what DNA? In your own DNA? Yeah, no, in our, in our case, in like some artistic uh, synthesized DNA. Yeah. But it's always a lot of planning. And actually the lab work is what you see, but like the bioinformatics and the, 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 the software bit and the planning bit is the biggest part of any uh, biology nowadays. Because in the uh, software you program how the guide RNA will be working and where it yeah. will attach and function. Yeah, yeah. there's great software uh, for this nowadays. Also free software, so if anyone is interested, you can kind of download any genome nowadays and then just try what those certain enzymes do when they cut, or like where could you program like a guide RNA to cut. And um, this is cool because biology is becoming more and more um, informatics in a way. So mm -hmm. the- Intangible. Yeah, yeah, and doable for people with a home computer. Mm -hmm. um, but to, to be honest, um, I don't remember exactly, but we did something with DNA, um, but it all went wrong. So you have to have a really clean environment uh, to make it work well. Yeah, true, true. I'm, I'm not clean enough. <laughs> um, right. This is a Dutch slide. But so with CRISPR, uh, with this technology, a lot of different things are done too. So I'm talking about the cutting of DNA and introducing of new genes, but you can also uh, knock out genes, like uh, cancel them. You can delete genes, you can activate genes. And people are kind of developing this one tool, which kind of binds to DNA in a certain place where you want it to bind, and then uh, develop all kind of new um, application for this and this is kind of this was two years ago this paper where i got this from or like one year ago but then now there's even more like different crispr technologies and it's really a field that's kind of blossoming in the sense that uh, there's a lot of like um, new techniques being developed can i just ask one more question yeah um a gene is that part of the whole dna strength so you have to know wh which gene is where on the dna um, kind of, yeah. As humans, for example, we have many genes, they're all in our DNA, but there's also many genes we might have that we don't know either what the function is or uh, what they do. So it's so sort of like... Um, but a they lot have of, a fixed yeah. place in the DNA, so you know where to find them? Yeah, usually they do, yeah. But um, yeah. So a lot of this works that I'm going to share. Yeah. So can we have one more question from Bas? Yeah. Hey, on. yeah, thanks. Yeah, I was wondering about the guide RNA. So you said that it attaches to like 20 base pairs, right? Uh, yeah, so kind of the, um, so it, it is longer, right? So the guide RNA and it has this loop oh. too, kind of it has its own structure. But then there's this one part, which is called the a matching genomic sequence in this slide. So uh, that, that, that is kind of a 20 letters long and that kind of, that, that, that matches exactly the part in the DNA where you want to cut it. Yeah, so I, I was wondering, doesn't it ever happen that you have a recurring sequence so that it can bind in the wrong spot? Yeah, this can happen. Actually, as part of a, it's a good question, as part of the project, what we did too is kind of try different lengths of this because normally it's 20 base pairs, but what happens if you make it like 12 or 15 and doesn't uh -huh. become more imprecise? Because this is one of the problems with CRISPR that they call this off-target effect. So how often do you cut at place where you don't want to cut? And um and what are the consequences? Yeah, and this is why in like human health, there's they're, 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 they're still testing it. So there's not a lot of like gene therapies as they call it yet, um, uh, which I want to do. But I, I read where they want to start with humans as well as the eye, because somehow if you inject something in eyes, it stays in the eyes because it's kind of um, not, not uh, very well connected to the rest of your bloodstream. So, um, so they might start with like rare eye diseases soon. Okay, cool. Thanks. Dylan also has a question. Yeah. Um, I, I see the donor DNA here. Is that part of the guide DNA or is that something separate? Right, that's something separate. So what happens is the DNA is cut and then um, the, there's a split, right? So the strand is split. But then if it's a cell where you do this in, the organism or the cell will try to repair its own DNA. Uh, and it can try to kind of just bind together again. But what will happen too is if you add a donor DNA, so like a small piece of uh, DNA floating around, it might um, use that to kind of include that in the hole, which was created by cutting it. And so you one of the reasons manipulated is it uh, while it's repairing itself. Yeah. You use that uh, time to yeah. manipulate it to insert well, donor you, you DNA. Like, 
to repair. When it repairs, it might include something which you have put there. And one of the reasons this works as well in bacteria is like when you grow bacteria on plates, for example, in a lab, you have millions of them. So it might only work in like, I don't know, 10% or something to introduce what you want to introduce. But then you can work with these 10% and they can grow exponentially again. So there's always like the question of like scale and repeatability in biology. Um, but yeah, so that, that's the donor DNA in this picture, which you can add. But then in our case, because it's always like synthetic, there was no organism which you worked in. So we had to kind of glue it in a different way. Um, okay, so this all was the, the, these projects which I'm going to share you were all developed when I worked uh, at Waag in Amsterdam. I'm going to talk about it a bit. This is at Newmark. There's the castle, which is like the oldest building in Amsterdam, which is not a church, it's the oldest non religious building. And it's uh, in one of the uh, towers, there's this open wet lab. This is a very old picture. It looks a bit different nowadays, but to be honest, it looks different every year when I visit again. Um, and it's a cool place to visit because they really focus on how to do biology outside of a regular lab. So as you can see here in a picture, for example, on the left, there's a pressure cooker like you can cook potatoes with, but then that's used to sterilize stuff instead of having like an expensive app apparatus. And, and, and there's also like, for example, in the middle here, a PCR machine, which like two years ago, nobody knew what PCR uh, was and now everybody's getting PCR tests all the time, which is cool, but this is like an open PCR, which is a 600 euro open source hardware PCR. And then there's also incubators here on the left, and these are lucky reptile egg incubators, but then you can also use like reptile egg incubators like for um, whatever bacteria you want to grow. So it's like, it's like um, making biology accessible by <laughs> cheapening the tools that you use. And Cool thing is a lot of the things is also online. So if you're interested in, in, in learning from this, it's all like open source, the solutions too. And what I was doing is lead the Biohack Academy, but I don't already talked a bit about that. And one of the parts um, in 2018, uh, which is part of the Biohack Academy is we had this film crew from Tegelicht um, visiting the lab. And this is me in the lab opening a, uh, do-it-yourself CRISPR kit from the Odin, which is an American um, biohack company by Josiah Zayner. And he's kind of notorious nowadays because in America, he's like the kind of media-friendly biohacker. But he sells uh, this kind of kits where you can do like do-it-yourself uh, biohacking or yeah, biology experiments at home. And one of the uh, things he sold was like this CRISPR kit where you could create... Um, a bacteria which became resistant to a certain antibiotic gene and then you can grow it on a on a food medium where where, where um, this antibiotic is present and then you can see if it survives because if it survives you were able to kind of introduce this one gene which made it resistant to the kind of the poison you give it right so you can kind of it, it kind of creates this test to see if, if you're able to introduce certain uh, dna parts to to these bacteria but then the thing in the Netherlands is it was illegal um, to actually go beyond the point or like it or like it's illegal when you start to create synthetic um, or when you start to create GMOs or genetically modified organism without having the license for it. And in the US or the UK, for example, it's much easier to do this outside of academia or outside of industry labs within the Netherlands. It's quite um, tricky business. So um, in this workshop, what we did, which was also filmed and part of the Tegelik documentary is we kind of went uh, through all the steps until the moment where we would actually put it in a heat bath and then at a certain temperature, it would actually disrupt the cells enough to introduce the DNA, but then we would create a GMO, right? So at a genetically modified organism. So at that point, we had a huge debate, like, should we do it? Should we not do it? What's the consequence of us like uh, walking across this line of the law now? And what if we all do it together? Does it make it better or not? So we had like this whole ethical debate about biohacking, um, which kind of is interesting in the documentary because they match, they, they, um, match it with other ethical debates um, around CRISPR, like whether you can um, uh, alter babies at birth or whether you can try to get rare diseases out of people who suffer from it. And funnily enough, I think one, two years after this documentary, one year after this documentary, in China, there was the news that the first CRISPR babies were born. I don't know if you remember this, but the scientist named Hay created uh, uh, two and then later turned out three 
uh, babies modify it to uh, not be able to get HIV in their life anymore by kind of deleting this one variant of uh, CCR5, like a gene that's related to HIV, which was very controversial because somehow it was also linked to intelligence. So the people were like, did you really want to make them resistant to HIV or do you want to create superhumans and who are you to decide for these kids? And then the Chinese government turned on him. So he's in jail and never was heard from again. So there's all these layers. Um, and the first uh, CRISPR babies have been born. But if you want to watch back this documentary, I would recommend it. Uh, 2018 it was from Dr. Kamat DNA uh, and the uh, Nobel Prize winners, or related Nobel Prize winners are also in it, um, which is kind of cool because I'm in a documentary with the Nobel Prize winners. And it talks about all these ethical dilemmas. Um, now for the next 20 minutes, um, I want to talk more about the kind of the technology of CRISPR in a specific project we did. And um, because your sense makers, I thought some of you might be more interested in also kind of the technical aspects of something like how you do a, a protocol or an experiment in the lab. It might be a bit technical, so some people might not follow, but uh, you can always ask any questions. And I know I only have like less than 20 minutes, so I probably won't go in a lot of depth, but... Um, Sorry, and for the people, if this is a little bit too technical, <laughs> uh, Steph will also restart with an introduction from the aspect of uh, program DNA. So that will be very basic again with... Uh, real world example examples as well yeah 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 that's great i'm very curious about steph because i saw this in the program and i think with something like crispr it's always nice if, or with sending well synthetic biology it's always nice if two speakers reintroduce it again because the field is so big that like whatever example you give you get a different uh, overview mm -hmm. um but so in this doctor in medina this tegelicht uh, episode we really talked about what's illegal to do um but then in the next project which i'm going to share we really thought about how to make something legal and then our solution was to do it in vitro. And uh, when you say in biology in vivo, it means you introduce a DNA into a living cell. But in vitro basically means you have a tube with water and like loose DNA floating around in it. So you only use the DNA as some, the molecule as some kind of storage medium, and there's no organism involved. Um, and because there's no organism involved, the, the, the law does not really apply because you don't create like a genetically modified organism. You just modify DNA without um, needing any cells or bacteria. Do you get the difference? And this is really um, cool and also kind of revolutionary in some way because some people think this in vitro method or like cell free, it's also called because you don't use cells, is the future precisely because you're not kind of bound by um, cells or bacteria, uh, which makes it much harder, but then also kind of easier to transfer across, for example, um, country borders, because it's a huge problem if you want to send bacteria somewhere, because then you're going to have all these laws about introducing organisms in different states. But also um, in countries like the Netherlands, it's just easier when you do like some software programming and then do some in vitro DNA on the side, because you don't need like a laboratory with a big license to be able to uh, modify organisms. And then I don't know any other projects with in vitro CRISPR or in vitro synthetic biology, really. So if you know any other examples, please tell me, which is why I'm proud of the project. And I'm going to call it here, how to Photoshop with DNA, because in a way what we did is introduce a digital image and then translate it into DNA and then Photoshop that DNA in the lab. So the image would change. And this is kind of a very roundabout way of changing a picture. But um, somehow it's kind of an artistic interpretation of what you can do with a technique like CRISPR. Um, and so I'm a bio artist, so I work with art in the field of biology. And uh, there's a big history of people working with um, encoding information into DNA. This might be my favorite bio artist, Joe Davis. And he works with like encoding information in uh, A, T, Cs, and G, so in DNA code since the 80s. Um, and here he's holding like a new project with kind of a four dimensional shape, which he wants to translate, which he has translated into DNA. And he works with like the George Church lab in Harvard. So it's both art and science and published in uh, journals as well as shown as shown at galleries and exhibitions. But his uh, first project ever was this uh, micro Venus DNA, where he translated this rune uh, into uh, a very short DNA code by first trans uh, translating into zeros and ones. 
and then translating these zeros and ones to the code of DNA, so C, T, Gs, and As. And uh, the cool thing is, um, he did this in the 80s first time, but nowadays DNA data storage actually uh, a booming field because, um, well, because DNA storage is a huge problem. Like there's all this big uh, DNA storage or like storage facilities for um, for data, but then computers die at some point, but now we can still find the DNA of mammoths, right? So we can still find 10,000 year old uh, DNA. So somehow storing stuff in, a, in, in this living, or not living, but in this kind of evolved um, or made by evolution method of, of storing information might be a very smart way. And also um, there's people who say like in one Eppendorf tube, so one little one and a half milliliter tube, you could potentially store like all the information in the whole world, like all the digital information because DNA is so small. Uh, so you can store like a lot, a lot, a lot in, in, in very little space. And this means it's a very um, interesting field, I think. And um, in this case, the project by Gunther Seyfried is an Austrian bio artist. And then there was me and Federico and Hunter Petschko. And uh, Gunther and me spent like weeks in the Open Wet Lab at, or months maybe, at Waag to, to, to make this project, um, which in the end uh, is about the translation of this picture uh, of a bull's head into uh, a digital image or into a, it's a it's a JPEG, so it's zeros and ones, but then uh, or a bitmap, sorry. But then we translate this bitmap into uh, with some algorithm into uh, DNA code. So every um, combination of zeros and ones is translated into some kind of G T C A combination in our software, right? Then we order that um, DNA, so that's synthesized by a company. We get it in the lab and we modify it using our process. And in the end, after this modification, we send that again to a company to sequence, and then we see if the image, uh, if the image uh, photoshopping worked. So we kind of have to retouch this image, and, and you only know if it worked after these weeks uh, of work. And this is very particular about biology, like contrary to like software or hardware, there's not really a direct effect. So often you have to wait like months or weeks until you get the data back, and then you know if it succeeded. Um, and what we did is we had this original picture of a bull's head, which is why it's called Return to Dilmun, because the, uh, um, the, 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 the mythology of it is it's from a kingdom of uh, Dilmun, which is in the current Bachrein, which is where the agriculture, for example, was invented like 4,000 years before Christ. And um, it's also a place where the mythical stories, such as the... Um, Apples of Gilgamesh and the Garden of Eden are said to be from. And all these stories, such as the Garden of Eden, Eden talk about like uh, the eternal life, or like uh, or Gilgamesh talks about like whether we can, or whether we can become perfect as humans, or whether we can become eternal. And um, this is an interesting kind of juxtaposition of the mythology and the technology because uh, with CRISPR, some people also hope that humans can become eternal in a way to kind of edit out our own mistakes, but can we? So this is kind of the artistic or the symbolic layer of the project. And this bull's head is kind of an artifact which is found in Bahrain. It's actually, or in, yeah, in Bahrain, it's actually the national symbol of Bahrain too. And um, these are kind of like gods of the harvest of 4,000 years ago when they started to do agriculture. And now we can ask ourselves when we move like, because then going from hunt together to agriculture, like the entire society changed, right? But now we go like from wherever we were to being able to edit our own DNA, which is again, a jump in whatever is possible. So, so there's all these kind of layers of um, meaning. And this is the original wool's head. Um, and then what we did is kind of, we had the original image on the left, we cut out the part of the eyes and then we introduced a separate part of DNA um, to kind of go from the closed eye bull to the open eye bull, uh, and this was the this is the kind of the goal of the project to have this um, to introduce this new part uh, of the eye of the DNA and to see if if that worked. And to do this, we spent like weeks in the lab um, doing a lot of PCR, so amplifying different pieces of DNA and putting them on gel boxes, which is this uh, technique to kind of see if you actually did amplify the DNA and how big the fragments are. So I have like a collection of, well, 50 of pictures of like different DNA fragments in the lab and whether we cut it or not. Um, 
This is the actual result. So you can see uh, it did work because the eyes are open and not closed anymore of the pool. But we also introduced some kind of uh, mutations or sequencing errors. And it was a big debate of all these are because of the, uh, the way we, we, we kind of read out the DNA or whether some of them are also caused by um, kind of the process we did in the lab. But uh, Gunther as an artist and, and me too, we're also like embracing the, embracing the mutations in this uh, picture in some part because it's partly also about, uh, about this question of whether CRISPR will always be perfect or whether it will create new artifacts. Um, okay, I have to plug in my laptop. Is there any question now? Just what, what you did is translate it to DNA, yeah. the picture, yeah. uh, then you synthesized it. Yeah. Uh, and then in vitro, you used CRISPR-Cas to edit it. Yeah. That's correct, yeah. But because you ha had to multiply, so the, the errors can come from CRISPR-Cas, but also from the process of multiplication. Um. Right, yeah. Well, this is biology always, like you never know what the error is um, or like where it went wrong. But I think in our case, it's also because the, um, so in this kind of DNA data storage, uh, people try to encrypt or kind of um, encode or what you call it, what you compress, I want to say, like compress data in such a way that you can kind of get a lot in a small bit of DNA. But in our case, it was kind of a very, non-intelligent way of translating the pixels into it's basically every pixel was like nine base pairs in dna mm. um, and this means we had like this super long fragments and this is much harder to read out by the machines that they use to kind of read or by the technique they used to um, read out the dna which is called sequencing uh dylan also has a question we have like five minutes uh Roland. okay dylan I was wondering how accurate uh, the reading process is uh, from DNA. Yeah, so this is a good question. So this really depends on the, um, the length of your um, of your of your piece of DNA. So in our case, it was really long, um, and then it's less accurate. But it also depends which method you use to uh, to do this sequencing. And nowadays, it's all kind of new methods such as the nano core which is really hip um which works like having this very small pore and then pulling this uh, dna through it and then using electricity sensing um what the what, what the different base pairs are and then somehow there was less accurate but then or more accurate but you cannot do the same length well there's all this kind of trade-offs so there's all these different techniques for either different lengths and different different accuracies yeah um, any other questions? I think if you want to change the laptops, uh, looking at the time, it's better to continue. Right. Yeah. So, so the next step is more if people do want to do more work with the actual workflow. So this is like a presentation I gave to scientists in Portugal um, a while ago about the work steps. And I'm not going to go through all of this, but this is just like the actual works of what we did. Um, so we start with creating the experiment and ordering the DNA parts. We amplify these in the lab. Then we synthesize this RNA. We cut using this Cas9 cutting. And then in the end, we did a fusion PCR to fuse it together again and create a bull's head. Uh, but I can show some pictures of this. So the cool thing is about the creating the experiment, we use Benchling. And Benchling is a very nice software. If you ever want to do anything with synthetic biology, I would recommend it because um, it's very easy to work with and very like intuitive. And a nice thing is, for example, that it shows, as you see here, kind of the length of the DNA, but also like the different enzymes you can use to uh, cut the DNA at this at that spot. So these are the words ab above it. And we use this software to kind of design our own experiment. And as I said before, kind of the design of the experiment, the kind of the pre-work before you do the actual lab work might be more important than the actual lab work in a way, because a lot of this biology is actually planning and scheming and thinking ahead um, and then we also did a lot of this so this is the uh, it's called gel electrophoresis and you use this to kind of separate different uh, uh, fragments of, of DNA in the lab 
um, I think for people areas. new, and uh, yeah, this is this this needs more clarification. Yeah, I, think. I know. I think. Um, do you I just have want to show link? this one slide. Uh, and I'll stop. <laughs> sorry. I just show, show this one slide and then I'll yeah. stop. No, no. I think if you have a, a link, because these you're introducing also new ter terminology, which yeah. I don't think people will. Um, yeah, maybe not. I'll just explain this shortly because it's kind of maybe easy to get because so there's this little gel here and a DNA is kind of um, negatively, negatively charged. So what you do is you put this current over it. Um, so one side is a plus and one side is a minus, the other way around, it minus and plus. So what happens then is the DNA wants to go towards the um, plus, right? So the, so the, because, it travels because it's, through the gel. Yeah, it goes to the gel. But then what happens is because the gel is, has kind of this structure, the um, small fragments go much farther than the big fragments because the big fragments uh, bump into more things in the gel than the small fragments. So kind of with time, you kind of separate these things. And then uh, what you always do is, is here on the right, it's called a letter. So this is kind of a, a, um, a fragment of, you know, exactly the size. So, you know, this one is 1000 bows base pairs. This is a 500 base pairs, etc., etc. And then on the left, you see, we have these different samples you put in the gel and you kind of compare their sizes to each other and to kind of the standard. And then you can say, ah, oh, I see this fragment. This means I have a fragment of this size of DNA. Um, and it's kind of a very crude way. And this is also to show that biology is very like wet and non uh, efficient and also kind of uh, you, you have to wait something like two hours on a gel like this and then you know if you actually cut your DNA or not um, which also makes it very exciting and this is also a do-it-yourself uh, light box with somebody made themselves so that's also yeah. cool yeah that's also what I loved from the biohack academy yeah uh, there's so many things you can build yourself uh, so I think I don't know if you can wrap it up because I think yeah. this gives a good, a nice idea of the possibilities. Yeah. Um, um, I'll just wrap it up by some, showing some pictures. So this is the lab when we work yeah. on it. It's a big mess. This is me. Because if people are interested, you have a, a website where you share also your yeah. projects. Yeah. So this project mm -hmm. is on my website. This is my link. And I added these pictures again because my current interest is the haptic interfaces for microbiome. So if somebody is into haptic interface for microbiome, send me a message too. And it's on my website. So this is my name and my website. Yeah. And the project which I just shared, Return to Dilbun, is also on the portfolio page there, as is the Tegelik documentary. Um, so um, yeah, feel free to reach out or learn more. Or, or... Just one more question. Yeah. Um, can you... Give an example of the haptic, what you're looking for, for people that are present. <laughs> Good question. Um, well, at the moment, um, so part of the research in this is, is inspired by kind of the interfaces haptics are used for like deaf blind people who, um, for example, have these on body devices with, for example, four or six different vibrating discs. And then you, you they try to develop this language where, for example, you can have language uh, translated into kind of vibrating systems. And I'm, yeah. I'm so, instead of yeah. working with language, I'm coupling that to kind of biological data. So I'm trying to find like um, a way to translate uh, bacterial data or DNA data into some kind of vibration language system. But um, I'm just using with Adafruit now, which is like a big company in the we know it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, Ada Food, but I'm I'm interested in kind of different types and different things. And I know there's also kind of companies with the VR world who work with this. And and for me, this is still very new. I usually take like years for projects to develop. So if somebody is into uh, haptics, uh, I'm very curious. Yeah. Great. I'll put that also in the next newsletter. Cool. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um...